I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. It's been a great week, and uh, we're rejoicing in what the Lord is doing and the progress uh, we're making. Enjoyed the class Friday night. If you haven't been a part of the class, uh, you're welcome to come uh, any Friday night. Um, some are working on uh, certain classes, but uh, if, you're, uh, if you want to come just for discipleship purposes, just to learn, uh, you are welcome to come in the cl to the class on Friday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're just an hour and a half, and uh, we had just had our fourth class. So I encourage you, uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, to come. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking specifically at uh, verse uh, 45, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. And I want to bow with you in prayer as we uh, enter into him speaking to us in his word. Uh, Lord, our hearts are just uh, absolutely hungry for your presence. And it isn't that we don't have your presence, and it isn't that we don't feel your presence. But Lord, we feel like we want more. We, it's the old thing, Jesus, where you told us if, in the Beatitudes that uh, if we'd hunger and thirst, we'd be filled, but the filling wouldn't just be a filling and we'd lean back and that would be it. It would be a filling that would create within us a hunger for more and a larger capacity and to know you better and to be more intimate. And I guess what, we re what I really want, Lord, is for you to shape me and, and mold me. I want your appetite. I want to think like you think. I want to desire what you desire. I long to just be immersed with you. Uh, life has been found there. Everything that's been bad in my life, everything that's been destructive in my living, everything that's literally ruined my, my character, my, the qualities that I have desired, and when they didn't happen, I, it was because, God, I wasn't intimate with you. I wasn't close. I wasn't, you weren't shaping me. You weren't flowing. And so today we're praying for a movement of the Spirit of God among us. We're praying for you just to surround us with your presence and your power. We pray for you to go beyond the babblings of some preacher and you would literally speak your own word directly to our inner heart. And Lord, you know all of our situations, our families and our, our loved ones and the people we care about and you, you know about the crisis that we're in and, and, and individually and you know about the dreams we have and for sure you know about the destiny and the plans you have for us. So we open ourselves to that today, that you would move in all of those circumstances. We release them to you. We open the door to you. Uh, you do. You speak. You, you operate. You, you get it done. And hey, however you want to use us in all of that is okay. Um, but if you want to bypass us, that would be all right too. For we claim no glory. We claim nothing as our own. But we give it to you. Thank you for the privilege. Bless your word Speak to us today, we pray thee, with your own voice. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the, uh, we keep going back to the premise of the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason is because if you don't get the premise, all is lost. Uh, it sets the tone of the entire Sermon on the Mount and gives you the perspective of everything he's going to say. Every statement in the Sermon on the Mount will come back to its explanation as seen in this premise. And he begins the premise, of course, with the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes, uh, he shapes the, what he's presenting as the kingdom of God. In the first Beatitude, at the end of the first Beatitude, he mentions the kingdom of God. In the last Beatitude, which is verse 10, chapter 5, he mentions the kingdom of God. And these become the bookends. In other words, he's talking to his disciples and saying, hey, I want you to know what you're getting yourself into. What we've experienced in the past, what we've done in the past, hey, that's going away. That's all being fulfilled. It's not going away in the fact it disappears. It's literally now being fulfilled in this new level. And guys, I'm taking you into a level that's so phenomenal. I'm taking you into a level that's just going to blow your mind. I'm taking you into a level that you're just going to shake your head and say, whoa, this isn't going to be true. This isn't going to be possible. But I'm telling you how it's going to be possible. That's the premise. How is it going to be possible? 
Well, you're going to embrace your helplessness. You're finally, after 2,000 years of the Old Testament, you are seeing you can't pull this off. After all you've experienced in your life, you're finally getting, duh, this is, I can't, uh, no, not gonna, nay, isn't gonna happen. I can try, I can work at it, I've worn myself out trying to be what I ought to be and just can't, I can't reach the level. But hey, what I'm talking about is you embracing that helplessness and allowing his very nature, his spirit, the reality of who he is to literally come and immerse with you, merge with you, literally intertwine with you. And somehow your helplessness and his resource, your nature, his nature coming together form this new person. And this new person, this new creature is called the kingdom person. And that's where you're going to live. That's his premise. If you will not embrace your helplessness, if you try to live out of yourself, hey, all is lost. It's the secret is found in your total response to him and allowing him to literally in you begin to shape and nurture you in a new way. That's his premise. Now, out of that premise, he begins to move into the fact that this is going to take you, this, this merger is going to take you to a whole new level. <laughs> and it's a level of righteousness that exceeds anything you've ever seen before. If you thought the Sadducees and the Pharisees, if you thought they were high up on the totem pole, if you thought they were righteousness, I tell you that might, your righteousness in verse 20, he says, must exceed, and he uses the word twice in the original language, must exceed, exceed everything that the Pharisees did. And of course, in their mind, there wasn't any way they could, they could exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. How could you be, how could you do any more than they did? In other words, how can you come to church more than any time the church doors are open? <laughs> you, know, you can only come when it's, I mean, there's no way to exceed, go beyond, because they did everything at the top level, but you're going to exceed that. And the reason is, well, I'll have to explain it to you, he says, by illustrating it. And he gives these six illustrations. And in every one of the illustrations, the first five illustrations all, as let me remind you, the first five illustrations start with a physical activity because that's where we live. Uh, the first illustration starts with murder, which is a physical activity. The second illustration starts with adultery. That's, hey, that's a physical activity. Hey, we live there. Uh, the, the, the third one starts with, the, hey, how can I get rid of my wife? I'm sick of her bad breath. That, that's a physical activity. The fourth one goes to the oath thing. Hey, I don't have to tell the truth unless I'm swearing ball with my hand on the Bible. So help me God. Then my integrity, I have to come through, brother. Shouldn't have done that. I have to tell the truth. See, that's a physical activity. Uh, the fifth illustration is an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, revenge thing. That's a physical activity. See, every one of them a physical activity. And what he does is he says, you don't start by trying to mold, change, alter the physical activity. You don't look at a physical activity and say, oh, I got to quit that. I got to stop doing that. I got to cut down on that. That isn't the way it works. You don't go there. You go to the inner heart motive of your being. What drives that? The appetite that produces that. The inner core desires that make that possible. Why do you do that? When that changes, the activity changes. So he takes the outside activity and drives it to the inner heart. For instance, you remember in the murder thing, the old timer said, I, yeah, I, you, do not murder. Jesus said, don't, don't hate. Well, where does murder come from? Anger and hate. Well, if you eliminated that, you wouldn't murder. Duh. <laughs> so this is not about managing your... What, what? Again, see, the reaction is, that's impossible. I know, that's what he's telling us. <laughs> yeah, it's a high level. I know, never to get angry. You're kidding me. Never get upset. I know. I get upset just thinking about not getting upset. <gasps> just, you know, just, oh, just, that's impossible. I know. Absolutely. Which proves his point. You're helpless. You can't get this done. It's got to be a merger. See, Christianity is an impossible. Now, you can have religion. If you want religion, go help yourself. Go someplace else and help yourself. Be very religious. We'll applaud you. But we're not talking religious. We're talking intimacy. We're talking 
We're talking Christianity. We're talking, we're talking Jesus. We're talking, see, this is on a whole different plane, he says. So the first five focus on a physical activity. Then he says, well, let's come to the sixth one, where we are. The sixth illustration, he says, let's not even bring up a physical activity. Let's just cut to the chase here. Let's just go to the bottom line. And what is the bottom line? Well, your motive. It's your, it's your motive. And he, and he gives us this verse 43. Look at this thing. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor Hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, we're concentrating on verse 45. And in in, the, in this illustration, of course, he's concentrating on not the physical activity. There's no physical activity mentioned. He's concentrating on what's going on inside, why you are the way you are, why you feel the way you feel. And, of course, our immediate response, my immediate response to that is to begin to defend my activity. I'm not talking about activity. I'm talking about inward motive. But immediately I begin to defend my, well, I didn't hit him as hard as I could have. <laughs> hey, I could have blown his head off, but I shot, his, I shot off his foot instead. <laughs> see, I begin to defend my motive. Do you see that? I begin to defend my motive by my physical activity. And see, there's nothing about physical activity in here. There's nothing about, you're to love your neighbor. How am I to love my neighbor? You're to love your enemy. How am I? He doesn't, see, there's no how in here. Not at this point. He's going to get into example in terms of the father, which is, a, but, but it's still not a how. It's a demonstration of. So he begins to talk about not defending your outward activity in the passage, but examining the deep inward heart of your being. Why is loving your enemy? Now, you remember, this is boundary language. And as he, we get into the rest of what he's saying in the illustration, he sets up boundaries. I love those who love me. That's a boundary. If you're within the boundary of loving me, I'll love you. If you step out of that boundary, I don't love you. If you greet me, I'll greet you if you're within the boundary of greeting me, saying hello, whacking me on the back. I'll greet you and whack you. But if you step out of that boundary and you ignore me, I'll ignore you. Jesus says, I want you to take the boundary and extend it to your enemy. Well, now, wait a minute. Who would be beyond my enemy? There is no one. That's as far as you can go. In other words, you're not going to have any boundaries. You're going to love everybody. What do you mean love everybody? It doesn't give any how. How are you going to love everybody? That's impossible. I know. That's the premise. You're helpless. You can't do it. Got that. Why is that so important, loving your enemies? Why? Now, he gives that in our passage, verse 45. Here's what we're looking at today. That you may be sons of your father. Did you get it? That you may be sons. I'm loving my enemy that I might be a son of my father in heaven. And there's some kind of connection going on between loving my enemy and being a son. Now, a disclaimer right here. Ladies, please. I'll only mention sons. But you're included. <laughs> please. In my mind, you're included. I'm not really, I'm not going to say sons and daughters because that gets too complicated for me. So, I'm just, I'm just going to stick with the passage. But hey, you're, you're, please, you're included in this. So, don't, don't feel offended. Please. That's a disclaimer. Okay, let's start on the passage. 
verse 45. That, stop right there. We're going to start with necessity. That introduces a purpose clause. It's the Greek word hopos, which is setting up a goal or setting up a, a, a result of or an, it's the aim of an action. In other words, I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you an action to have in your life. And here's the goal. Here's the aim. Here's where that takes you. Here's the purpose of that. So loving your enemies has a distinct purpose in mind. Because it qualifies you as a son of your father in heaven. That's what he's saying there. Now we've been talking appetite language. And I... I really like that language because, I don't know, it just kind of clarifies for me what I'm really dealing with. You say motive. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, that isn't too clear. That's more of a philosophical term. But appetite, I understand that. Man, I'm hungry. Appetite, I get that. We discovered that in philosophy, appetite or, or a motive has three aspects. One is, and we went over this uh, several, several, several Sundays ago, but one is an external object. That's a part of motive. Also an internal principle. That's a part of motive. And then the feeling that brings about a result is a part of the motive. In other words, the motive is made up of three things. But the heart of the motive is the internal principle. Example, here's a slice of bread. I have, that's an external object. Here's an internal principle. I am hungry. That, as I look at the bread, produces a feeling and desire that causes me to eat the bread. What's the pivotal issue of that? Well, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Now, you understand. You understand that the object, the external object is important. Because it feeds to the internal principle. Bread, I'm hungry. But hey, I look at dog manure, I'm not hungry. <laughs> I have no appetite for that. So my appetite, so the core of motive is appetite. What do you hunger for? What do you really want? <coughs> Bottom line, down to it, what is your really, in, what is your internal craving? Now, do you see that which we went through? Probably you're too young. But we went through this, what would Jesus do thing? There's a book over there. It's an old time book uh, written by Sheldon. And he came up with this uh, group of people who uh, would uh, decided to ask the question before they did anything. What would Jesus do? And that would determine all their activities. Well... Out of that, the evangelical church made millions because we made bracelets, you know, and you wore WWJD and we sold them and it was really great. We laid a lot of money on it. But see, it isn't exactly right. It's not wrong. It's not bad. It would be a beginning step, I suppose. Nobody would criticize you if you did that. But that's not what we're talking about. This is not about what would Jesus do. Trying to figure out what Jesus do. Make my shape my life up to do what he did. No, this, what we're talking about is literally the person of Jesus coming to indwell you. And indwelling you, you begin to want hunger, appetite. what he wants see that's different than just trying to shape up and do what he'd do that's I want to feel like him don't you want to be so close to Jesus if you to feel like him Man. don't don't you just want to be so full of him that you just hey what he wants I want what he desires I desire it's the way he feels is the way I feel don't you want a kind of relationship with God that isn't just, you know, you just, your whole life is just some kind, somehow immersed in him and you just crave what he craves. See, that's, that's sonship stuff. 
So what he's telling us in the passage then, it's not a rule, it's not a discipline yourself, it's not, hey, chap, slap those hands and cheap, but man, we're watching you. See, it isn't that kind of deal. It's the kind of deal where I, 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 I get so in tune with the Father in heaven that he, I'm a son and I have, this, I have this appetite that he has and this desire that he has. Man, I want that. So the, the aim, the purpose, this is a purpose clause. So love your enemies, not so you can be a son, because loving your enemies won't make you a son. It's why don't you become a son? So you can love your enemies. And you understand when we say love your enemies, we're not feeling, oh, tickles up and down my spine. I feel good about you. <laughs> See, we're not talking that. <laughs> See, wow. I can drift ice down your back and you'll feel that too. So, See, that's not the deal. See, what we're, what we're talking about in, in love is, is really, would investment be a good word? Oh. See, love invests. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave, he invested himself. The cross was an investment. Wouldn't it be something if I felt like about you the way God feels about you, so I invested in you? Oh. I extended, and that's, that's something of what he's dealing with in the passage, that love really has to have, invest, love really has to invest itself in the individual that it loves. In fact, in the uh, fifth illustration, which is the uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, he says, don't resist, don't do that, don't, the revenge thing, it, well, be fair. That's, he said, that's not good enough. Don't resist the evil person, and, but invest in them. When a guy comes up and insults you, what are you to do? Invest in him. Man. Don't insult him back. Don't cut him off. Invest in him. When he comes and makes you take his packages a mile, invest in him and go another mile. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your life? Whoa. They'll take advantage of you all the time. <laughs> well, that's impossible to do. You're right. See, it, prove, it proves his premise. Love your enemy. Well, that's the craziest thing. And it's interesting. Love, and we talked this last Sunday, love and prayer. Love your enemies. And then he describes your enemies as those who despitefully use you and persecute you. So this is the same. Love and prayer. What if they're the same? I didn't say that very well last week, but that was the idea, that these are the same. Prayer and love are the same thing. So the idea of praying for my enemy, oh, Lord, move him to California and make him prosperous. <laughs> it's not what he's talking about. It's a love that as God invested in you when you were his enemy, you are going to invest. Whoa. And why is that so necessary? Because it's sonship. It's intimacy. It's feeling like he feels. It's oneness with him. I don't have that. And you're not a son. Well, that's impossible. I know. You got to be a son. Now, he moves from there, from necessity, that purpose thing, to nurturing. Oh, I love this. I love this. That you may be that's a nurturing thing. You may be, as a translation of the Greek word, genomai. 
And genomai is where we get our word Genesis from, which is about origin. It's about to be. It's about becoming. So there's a whole emphasis in the passage, in the statement about nurturing. In fact, it's in the subjective, this will excite you, it's in the objective mood, which means it's a possibility. It may not be, but it's possible. Hey, you may not have it, but it's possible. It may not be present in your life, but it's possible. This could happen to you. This could be, the impossible could become possible. And it's in the aorist tense, which we don't have anything like it in the English, so there's no way to translate it. But the aorist tense is what I call the non-tense. Not nonsense, but non-tense. In other words, it isn't past, it isn't future, it isn't present. It's the focus on the action of the movement itself. So what he's talking about is, don't, when did this happen to you? We're not talking about that. Will it be present? And we're not talking about that. Do you have it? And we're not, what we're talking about, would you live in the action of the nurturing of God in your life? Would you allow the very essence of his life to literally merge with you and would you stay right there in that action of the merger, your helplessness in his divine being, your nature in his nature literally coming together to form this new creature and would you let him father you? See, what we're inviting you to it's not, well, bump your head once down there, twice down there, and you'll be okay. We're not inviting you to come and sign on the line, and hey, you'll, we'll, we'll register your name. See, what, what we're inviting you to is to enter into such an intimate relationship with him and hang right in there in that relationship, loving him with your whole heart, totally open to him, responding to him in this intimacy of oneness and allowing him literally to shape you nurture you from the inside. So if you say to me, well, Manly, I want this. Okay, but I don't always feel the way I ought to feel about people. Okay, would you let him change you? Would you not resist? Would you be open to seeing your enemy through his eyes. Would you let him take his hands, his, his skillful hands, and would you be the clay that he just begins to, and would you let him shape you into what he's dreamed you could be? Would you let him nurture you? What would that look like? Well, Jesus, you know, it's the Jesus name. You realize, and hey, we go over this all the time, but God leaped off his throne and became this helpless babe, which means obviously he gave up everything he had as God, every advantage he had as God. He set it aside. God knows everything. Jesus as a babe knows nothing. So he gave all that up to become here. So he became helpless like you are. And what did he do? He allowed the Father to nurture him <coughs> in the sonship. In fact, if you read like uh, Luke 2, 5, 52, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Wow. That's a nurturing thing. Wouldn't it be something for your life literally be, to begin to be shaped by the relationship of the Father and you that is within you? Oh. In fact, it says about him in Hebrews, listen to this, though he was a son, yet learned he obedience through his suffering. Now, everybody, all Bible scholars say that's a picture of the Garden of Gethsemane. You mean Jesus wasn't obedient? And then the father whipped him into line and he became, no, no, he's always been obedient. We got that. He's always been obedient. But he's never been to a garden of Gethsemane before. Hey, that's a new deal. <laughs> You're always getting that kind of thing in your life, aren't you? You're always stepping into situations. Wow, I've never been here before. 
What are you going to do with that? Jesus stepped into a new situation, Garden of Gethsemane, and said, Oh, Father, shape me in this. What are you trying to? And he learned obedience. The Father shaped him because he was open and responding. See, in the relationship of sonship then, there's this nurturing process whereby he's literally within you, shaping your life. Will you let him do that? Will you respond to him? Will you? Will... It's interesting. First Corinthians chapter thirteen is the love chapter. In the chapter, he describes love. Love is long suffering. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love does not behave rudely, brother. Love does not seek its own. Thinks no evil. Does not. Rejoice in iniquity, rejoices in truth. When he gets done with that, he says, hey, when I, was a co- when I was a kid, I acted like a kid. I thought like a kid. I was a kid. But now I've become manly. <laughs> And in my manliness, I have put away childish things. I quit acting like a four-year-old. I quit whimpering in the car. Well, you don't know what they did to me. I stopped that. Why? Because there's this nurturing. I'm a son. And in this nurturing process, he literally, he literally shapes me into being man, being mature, being, whew. I, I, you know, I, I think it's time for me to grow up. <laughs> man. Look at the next statement. That, the necessity, you may be the nurturing sons. Oh, that's the native. We're, we're native sons. We belong here. This is our land. <laughs> yeah, we're sons. Now, again, ladies, remember, you're in. So, this is sonship stuff. It's interesting. It's a predicate, it's a, uh, it, it's a predicate, predicate nominative which is the idea that you may be sons. So sons and you are the same. You could flip it. Sons are you. You are sons. Because it's the verb of being. So you got this this, this sons thing. that And sons is used 370. The Bible goes wild with sons. 379 times it's used in the New Testament. (laughs) Which is phenomenal. It's the strongest word. Strongest used word. For this relationship, we're sons. Uh, Brothers? Hey, we're brothers with Christ. Yeah, we are. Okay. But you understand what that means. The reason he was telling us we were brothers is to tell us we were sons. Because we're brothers with Christ because God leaped off his throne and became this helpless man. And in this helplessness, he, he was filled with the Father and became exactly what we are. So since Jesus is exactly what I am, helpless, and he was filled with the Father, and I'm helpless, and I'm filled with the Father, and I'm a son, he's a son. That makes us brothers, which talks about the sonship. Yeah. So brothers is not who we really are. Oh, we are. But hey, we're what we really are is we're sons. We're sons, people. We're sons. And it's and and he this is the strongest language, folks. It's just really we're not servants. Oh, it says we're servants. There's there's places that say we're servants. Yeah, but see, Paul says he's a servant. But see, that's my perspective. See, I'm the prodigal son. I come home. Hey, I'm only worthy to be it from my view. I'm only worthy to be a servant. From God's view, he says, no, you're a son. So my view of it is servanthood. His view of it is your sonship. So son is the deal. See, the high point, I'm not an employee. I don't put the time clock with God. See, this is not God has little, a big chart in the sky with little blocks, one for every day. Did you have your devotions? Check. 
See, I'm not punching a time clock. How many times did you pray? Check, check, check. Have to read your Bible every day. Okay, okay. Put my Bible on my nightstand. Get up in the morning. Look at it. Jesus wept. Got that done. <laughs> Come on. See, that's a sonship, folks. Come on, do you get this? See, this is, this is, oh, he is coming. He's in, he's living within me. And when, as he lives within me, there's this intimacy. There's this, oh, I feel he's nurturing me. And as he nurtures me, it nurtures me. He's doing that because I'm his son. See, that's so strong. That's strong language in the passage. Uh, listen to this. This is John 1, 12. 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. <laughs> Birthed, fathered. Listen to this one. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. That we should be called children of God. Folks. Therefore the world does not know us. Because it did not know him. Beloved now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Oh listen to this one. Romans 8 14 and 16. For as many as are led by the spirit of God. These are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. By which we cry Abba Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. See this is a big deal. All of Christianity revolves here. You were literally birthed. Now bring it into its context. Love your enemies. Why is that so important? Because it's sonship stuff, guys. It's being a son. And when I'm a son, I'm nurtured by the Father. He shapes me. He, it's the purpose. Out of me spills the demonstration of who he is. Because he's, 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 he's shaping my life. With his, he's fathering me. <laughs> Ooh. Now, this last statement in the passage, I know sermons are only have three points, but wow. This one has four. I didn't write it, so it's not my fault. <laughs> that necessity. You may be nurturing. Sons, native, it's our territory. Of your father in heaven. Now that threw me off. Because I may not want to say, no, 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 no. See, that bespeaks separation. He's up there, I'm down here. All this whole thing is about what? Merger. He's not up there, he's in here. <laughs> so get rid of the in heaven stuff, please. Why didn't he say father in your inner spirit? He's your father in your inner spirit. He's your father in the depth of the core of your being. See, I would have said, amen, brother, preach it. See, I would have bought that. But he says, your father in heaven. And then I said to myself, well, it's only one place. I'll just draw a line through it, forget it. It's everywhere. <laughs> In the same chapter, look back at verse 16. In verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, brother. So there it is again. And go to chapter 16. Look at verse 1. He says, Take heed that you do not, that you do, not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. There it is again, brother. In fact, uh, go down to verse 9. In verse 9, he says, it's the Lord's Prayer. And you've memorized that one. 
and it says, pray in this manner, our Father. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Then he sets up in verse 10, which is the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like what's going on up there it should be going on down here. Oh. Then look at verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father, your Father in heaven. There it is again. Wow. Look at chapter, uh, or look at, uh, look at verse uh, 26 of chapter 6. And he says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Oh, man. Look at verse 32 of the same chapter. He says, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your Father in heaven knows you have need. Need of all these things. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. In chapter 7, verse 11, he says, if, your, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more you, will your Father who is in heaven give good things? Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And this thing is all over the place. Father in heaven. So I said, well, I guess that's what it says. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? Well, it's the emphasis not of location. <coughs> Father in heaven. Where's he located? In heaven. Glad he's not down here. Whoa. See, it's not about location. It's about heaven above, earth below, it's about control, influence. <coughs> it's about who's running the show. Who's above? Well, he settled that in the premise. You're helpless. And the minute you think you're, whoa. So in your helplessness, um, embracing your helplessness allows him who is above you, who is more than you, who is beyond you, who is more able than you are, who is adequate and you are not, to come. So this in heaven stuff is all about somehow authority and entering into and coming under the influence of. So if I'm going to be a son, what does this mean? It means I'm going to come under the authority the nurturing that my response in all of this is going to be, oh, you're the father in charge. Father me. Now, there's a problem with it. Uh, it may not be a problem for you, but in the evangelical church, I think we have a problem with sonship with our concept of sonship. Because I think what we've developed in our churches, we've developed spoiled brats. I'm a son! Well, you spoiled brat. See, I want the father, I'm a son, so I want the father to... See, I want to show up to the Father with my hand out. I'm a son. Come on. I don't want to show up with my work clothes. See, when I need something, I want to show up to the Father. Come on, Father. I don't want to knock on his door and say, Hey, Father, I've got my work shoes on, man. I'm ready to go. What are, you, what, what are we doing today? See, I don't want him to spill my life out. I don't want him to control and use me for his glory. I don't want him to fulfill it. Can you imagine God knocking on your door and saying, listen, I got a problem. Okay, God, what's your problem, brother? I got enough of my own. I don't need yours too. And God says, yeah, I got this scene uh, going on down there in Philippi. And I got a jailer. 
that I want to get saved. I need to, his life needs to be changed for the sake of his family and his kids. Wow. I can't go into details for you, he says, but man, like what I got is I got this, this guy down there and, he, and, and I'm going to establish a church based on him and I need you to go down there and, uh, and work on him. Okay. How long is it going to take? Well, take quite a few days. Why? Because they're going to throw you in jail. What? They're going to beat your back. What? They're going to put your hands in stock. What? And I want you to be so glad about it at midnight you start singing. What? <laughs> well, do you have my heart? Well, yeah. Are you my son? Well, yeah. W will you get in on what I'm in on? Well, God, I've got my own agenda. Then you're not a son. See, in our concept, our cultural concept, I'm a son and I never can quit being a son. Now, we've transferred that into our theology. I was born again. I can't ever quit being born again. I'm not a very good son. I may even be a prodigal son, but I'm still a son. No, you're not. That's from our cultural, we've imposed our cultural view of sonship into the scriptures. The biblical view of sonship is that he is in me, fathering me. And if he is not in me, fathering me, I'm no longer a son. Because sonship is not about just a birthing thing at a period of time. It's a living in the shaping, nurturing life of the father. So see, what he's proposing to you is not just a religious experience. Yeah, I've had one. Yeah, he's not, well, yeah, I was baptized. See, he's not, no. What he's wanting is, he's wanting, he's wanting you to become a son where he's birthed in you and he's fathering you and you live in the state of the shaping of his being and you begin to feel like he feels and want what he wants and you, cut, you show up with your work clothes on, man, saying, here I am, God. What, what, what we got going today? What are we going to do together today? I'm usable. Come on. My whole life is a destiny that you have planned for me. And I'm in. And in that shaping and molding, I become a son. And you know what is an essential ingredient of the expression of that sonship. Love your enemies. Feel about them. Like he does. Have his appetites. So I propose to you today, there are no spoiled brats in the kingdom. <laughs> Grow up. Come on. Get with it. Show up at the door. Work clothes on. Okay, God, what are you going to do with me today? Sonship. Whew. Oh, Jesus. My, my, my. My uh, griping and complaining is embarrassing. Forgive me, O oh God, when I have not uh, felt like you felt. And I guess it wasn't that I f didn't feel like you felt. I didn't feel like you feel. I, g I guess that wasn't the problem. The problem was I wasn't responding to your feelings. I was determined to have my own. And I was nullifying the sonship and the intimacy. Of your presence. So in the class God. We've been talking about this saturation thing. And this practicing your presence. And this living constantly. With a God awareness. Within me. And, and God could I. Could I. Could you. 
Could you and I get together in such intimacy and such oneness that I live with you all day long, aware of your strength and your power and your love and your embrace? And, and could, I become, could I become aware of, oh, you're, you're shaping me, and could I respond to how you feel so I could become an expression of that? With my work clothes on, an expression of that. It's not your destiny for me. Lord, I cry out to you today. Break me. Smash me. Save me from myself and the stench of my own self-centeredness and my own little plans and my own little desires and Save me from the evilness. I'm not embracing my helplessness. But constantly trying to live out of myself. Break me of that, God, until with the flowing intimacy of your presence, I live in the wonder. of being a son of the father who's in charge. Uh, heads are bowed. At this moment, he is wooing your heart, calling you to a deeper, more complete response to his person. Would you open up to him today? Would you allow him to infiltrate, to immerse, submerge, merge, Whatever the word is, however it is with you, would you let him just, would, would you let the person of Jesus bathe you in the wonder of himself? And would you let him father you, nurture you, shape you, determine your attitudes? Would you respond to his feelings until they become yours? Would you respond to the way he thinks until you think like him? Would you respond to his attitudes until you have his attitudes? Our altar is open if you'd like to kneel. It's a place of submission and a place of... Oh. Hungering and thirsting. It's a place of. Admitting. So our altar is open for you. Just some moments of seeking. I want to seek again today. Want to join me?